Welcome to the Tuesday, February 13th, 2024 meeting of the Arlington Artificial Turf Study Committee. Um, we're meeting virtually, and tonight we have some great guest speakers, but we still have to follow our agenda. It's a couple of preliminary items, including uh, acceptance of meeting minutes from our last meeting, which was two weeks ago. So, Jim, do you want to do the roll call first? Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, that's okay. Uh, so Mike, I do not see Mike just yet. Uh, but Mike, I think Mike's away. Mike's away. Okay. Absent. Okay. And then uh, Joe Barr. Yep. Here. Uh, Leslie. Yep. Uh, Here. Jill. Here. Marvin. Here. Welcome back. Uh, Natasha here. And Jim. Here. Uh, Joe Conley. Here. And Claire. I'm here. Perfect. Okay. So I hope everyone's had a chance to look at the minutes from our last meeting, which was two weeks ago. Um, sent out with the agenda. Um, if you haven't, take a take a few seconds to, to look at it now. Um, and if someone is comfortable with it, I would entertain a motion. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Okay. Uh, okay. Motion. Is, is a motion and seconded. So. Um, yep. I'll go through. Call the roll, please. Okay. Uh, that was Jill who seconded. Um, okay. So Mike is absent. Um, Joe Barr. Yes. Okay. Uh, Leslie. Yes. <clears throat> Jill. Yes. Marvin. Yes. Natasha. Yes. Jim? Yes. Perfect. Okay. The meeting minutes passed. Great. So, um, Natasha, do you want to just give us a quick uh, summary of correspondence received? Sure. So we received a couple of um, emails. One was from Susan Chapnick, and it had to do with um, high school athletic injury rates. Um, artificial turf versus natural turf. Um, I believe this was from um, 2001, I'm sorry, 2001, 2021. Um, so that was forwarded on to us. And then a second email from Susan Chapnick um, from Mount St. Sinai. Uh, and this was the School of Medicine. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the title of the document there, uh, but that that was sent on. Oh, no, you know what it is? It's a letter to town meeting from April uh, last year. So that was in there. And then um, our third email was from Mike uh, Guildsgame from our, our committee here. And it was in regards to the Mass General Brigham's turf versus um, turf uh, study. Uh, I'm sorry, a report from Mass General Brigham's. And that's so. So, yes, uh, I want to thank the people who submitted these items. Um, I always uh, enjoy reading them and always get something out of them. Uh, so thank you. Uh, so, I, Natasha, unless you have anything else, I think I'll jump into the next the main item on the agenda. Yep, that would be great. Um, so tonight is our first night with some guest speakers. It will not be our last night, and I'll explain more about that later. But tonight we have... Two, I, I think, uh, spe two speakers that I think will be very enlightening for us. One, uh, who will sort of address some issues more from the safety perspective and some of the questions the safety working group's been trying to work through. Uh, the other, um, more from the environmental perspective and some of the issues that the environmental and to some degree the health group has been trying to work through. So um, without further ado, I'll have Joe introduce our first uh, speaker of the night, uh, Samantha Jones, who Joe um, reached out to and uh, we were very happy, was able to uh, get the speaker to come and speak to us tonight. So Joe, I'll Great. let you take it from here. Great, thanks. Um, thanks, Jim. So yeah, the uh, our safety commission, obviously we're you know, talking a lot about um, the comparisons between player safety, between artificial turf and natural grass. And um, the more we read, you know, the more we came up with, um, you know, there were certainly pristine artificial grass fields, and then there were uh, Arlington fields. And um, so then we said, you know, to try to get a more, you know, I guess Arlington view on, you know, the injuries, we said, wow, the high school must have 
some kind of data. You might remember we talked about this a few weeks back. And we said, well, there really is no, um, you know, database for the MIA keeps regarding, uh, you know, injuries with comparable to artificial turf versus turf, uh, natural turf, sorry. Um, and uh, what we said, maybe we could reach out to the athletic director and the athletic training staff to see if um, they could speak to what they were seeing um, as the ones that are really uh, on the fields with the athletes and they have both artificial turf fields and they play on natural grass fields and just really get their take on, uh, or I guess in this case it would be Samantha's take on what she's seeing out there, what injuries uh, may be more prone uh, to the artificial turf at the high school and what injuries might be she's seeing at some of the grass fields such as Thorndike and in Magnolia. Um, and then maybe answer any questions we might have. So um, I have not talked to Samantha. I have no idea where this is going to fall, but I thought, um, you know, uh, it would be good to, to hear right from a, um, an Arlington source. So with that said, Samantha, if you hope you can hear me, if you could um, take it from there. Yes, sorry. My connection might not be great because I'm sitting in the high school and I am in the old building, so I don't have the greatest connection. So can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Awesome. So thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, Joe, thank you for the introduction. So for the, like Joe said, for those who don't know, I'm the, I'm Sam Jones. I'm the athletic trainer at the high school. Um, I do work with all the athletes that we have here. So currently in our winter season, we have about 489 students um and then in the fall we had like a record-breaking number of like 400 540 so we had a lot of kids come in through and out through the athletic training room um so I do see daily injuries it depends if it's on the turf or on the grass just based on where those kids are practicing um but in my experience at least from what I've seen at Arlington the injury rate is about the same if I had to put it down to grass versus turf, I see pretty much the same things based on um, where those kids are practicing. Most commonly it's ankles and knees. And that's really what I've seen a bunch of, especially this fall, um, mainly in our soccer programs is where I would say this is the most um, pertinent and where you'll see the most grass versus uh, turf just because th those are the teams that are mainly utilizing those fields. That's great. Oh, so, oh, oh, is there sorry. is there any difference between um, male and female? I'm just curious. There can be. So yes. Yeah. So in female athletes, you typically well, I've typically seen, and as research shows, you see more knee injuries such as a torn ACL. But that has more to do with the different body mechanics of males versus females. So females have wider hips. Therefore, you're more likely to tear an ACL just based off of that and also the hormones that your body naturally produces. So female athletes are more likely to tear an ACL based on the amount of estrogen in their system compared to males. So that's something to also take into account. You really can't say because of, oh, there's they're on turf, they're more likely to tear it. It's a lot to do with basic body mechanics as well. Could I ask a question? Um, I was just wondering, um, yeah, in terms of, course. of um, playing games and practice, um, do the teams play and practice mm -hmm. on turf and grass, or is it, you know, they play mostly on turf and um, practice mostly on grass, or is it kind of a mix? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. Um, so mainly our varsity level sports all play on turf. That's something that with the turf schedule, since we do only have one turf field at the moment, we try and make it so that our varsity teams stay consistently on that turf field. And then our freshman and junior teams typically are outsourced to those grass fields. So um, they are constantly staying there. There's, I think, maybe one occasion where a JV team played on our turf field right behind the high school, but mainly those teams are staying at those fields that they're at. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Any, um, other question, any other questions for Sam? I, I, I know this is an opportunity to get both the perspective of someone who 
I've seen athletes on both types of turf, but also can give you an Arlington perspective of what she's seen here. So, so Sam, Sam we had some questions about heat. Um, and yes, because we're heat is actually in the health group versus the safety group. Um, but we were wondering, um, is there MIA training specific to heat? Um, and and what is you know what kind of training do do coaches that play outdoors go through? Mm -hmm. Yes. So in accordance to MIA policy, we have a heat modification policy. So it's, I have a specific thermometer I use. It's called a wet bulb thermometer. It takes into account the heat index, the humidity, the type of surface that you're on, and it gives you a reading based off of that. And so the MIA has created this breakdown of certain degrees and based on how hot it is, each team is restricted based on those levels of heat per se so i go out it's normally during the tryout season so like august september when it's a little bit warmer i go out about an hour before the first practice is supposed to begin and i'll start taking um that will build temperature and we'll restrict practices based on that and all of our coaches are versed in this we go over it before the season begins um so there's not specifically a training i would say but we do review it um there the Practices are heavily restricted based on the heat just because, again, Arlington is a big town and I can only be in one place at once. So just making sure that I'm taking that whoop bulb temperature like I drive to Thorndike, I'll take it before the JV team practices there, make sure they're allowed to and things like that. So, Sam, just to clarify, you're taking the, that temperature on both the grass and the turf fields? Yes, I take it on both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank and you. it's typically higher on the turf field based on how the turf field absorbs and reflects heat. So therefore most of our grass teams. So for example, like this past tryout season in August, um, our JV soccer teams were allowed to practice for about 30 minutes longer than some of our varsity teams, just based on the heat waves on the turf. But that's something that you can work around. Um, how we knew, would work around or I'd recommend that is you're training earlier in the morning if it's like 6 a.m. so the temperature isn't as hot or you're going later at night like 8 p.m. where it's not as hot outside. Okay. Sam, I wonder, I mean, I'm asking you to Sorry, look back I'm a little questions bit. questions in the chat. I see these. I'm trying to catch up. Um, and so, Sam, if like, what is the heat differential? If you, can you just, I'm not asking you to be exact, but if you took a, you know, a heat um, mm. from Thorndike to then the turf, is it, are you finding a 20 degree difference or 30 degree difference or? Typically it's about, I would say about a 10 degree difference. If you're the turf can be about 10 degrees warmer, especially when it's like a higher humidity outside. Um, it just depends also like the breeze. I will say Pierce field has a great, it is basically a wind tunnel. So that does decrease the temperature as well. Like having the breeze helps out and things like that. Um, but it's typically around, I'd say a seven to 10 degree difference is how I would base that off of. Great. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. And are you, and, and you said August during the tryouts, are you seeing more of these going into, you know, later in the year mm -hmm. into um, or earlier in the year in the, June or uh, September timeframes? Or is it really limited? To so in August? regards to heat injuries? Yeah. Yeah. In, in regards to heat injuries, yes. I'm seeing those more mainly that two week of preseason, maybe the first couple weeks of September. But once the temperature dips down, it stays there. And knock on wood, I've we've had – no crazy heat injuries in Arlington. Um, we've done pretty well of making sure things are restricted and that athletes are properly hydrated. There's shade available for them. Um, we have cooling towels. We constantly have ice for them if needed. Um, but again, it's normally those first two weeks in August and then maybe the two weeks in spring. Um, I rarely have to worry about it in May and June just because it depends on how long teams make it into the tournament season for our spring teams. Um, um, but if anything, maybe the last two weeks in May, I'm worried about it a little bit more. But otherwise, it's mainly those that first couple of weeks of the, the fall season. Um, hi, is there any kind of formal training for either coaches or for kids on, I guess, you know, recognition of signs and symptoms of heat strain? 
Yes. So specifically for um, us at Arlington, we send this out every year and it's available on our athletics website. It's in our emergency action plan. Um, we have specific signs and symptoms followed by the MIA's heat modification policy of what breaking down like heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and heat cramps look like just so that you know the difference and how to anticipate them. And I also do review it every season with coaches. Um, so before the fall season, we have a big coach and staff meeting. I review it with them. I review it with all the players before for every tryout season as well we always meet before tryouts and then i also do the same thing with um cold weather exposure for our outdoor winter athletes and some of our spring athletes such as the lacrosse teams okay thank you yeah um susan I, um, i'm seeing your questions in the chat i'm sorry i'll get to them no yeah. i sorry I apologize. And you don't have to I'm answer the I'm questions mean... in the chat you can yeah. if you want to but you don't those aren't from committee members so um you okay. know, if you want to weigh in that's that's okay. your choice but you know you don't okay. have to. um okay okay i'll give you a minute if you want to i mean certainly but if not we can we can ask yeah no questions. i definitely no that's fine to... um i can answer the question about the injuries on graph and grass and turf fields about the same um as as of right now in the fall when i saw the turf fields and grass fields I, it was about the same i would say i had about a steady number of kids coming in from freshman and jv teams to varsity teams um some injuries are more significant than others it just depended again on multiple different factors i wouldn't say the surface was the main factor in those injuries a lot of it had to do with the athletes biomechanics how much mu muscle mass do they have prior to that injury? How much did they, what was their athletic ability like? What was the situation they were playing in? Um, and all things like that. And then the severity I would say is probably the same. The most severe grass injury we had this fall would be a JV boy soccer player. He had a tibial plateau fracture, but that was because someone stepped on his foot and he got stuck underneath per someone. So I wouldn't say that was more the surface. Um, and then we had a couple ACL tears on the turf this year, but again, both were female athletes. It's again, sadly more common in female athletes. So there's a lot of factors that we into those. That's helpful. You know, Sam, I, correct me if I'm wrong in this, but you know, looking at various, mm -hmm. and I will say, Jill, we, we've been looking into heat as well. So, and I, and Natasha, I've talked, there's, our groups there would probably be some overlap on the heat question but but you know mm -hmm. looking at heat you know i believe the M mia has i mean granted their guidelines they're not hard and fast rules but compared to some other communities and other parts of the country where it actually runs much hotter than arlington they have some pretty mm -hmm. um strict guidelines about temperature if i'm not mm -hmm. mistaken i think they recommend no use of a field if the temperature if the if the outdoor temperature goes above 86.1 degrees Fahrenheit is that correct yeah yes it is it's so it's based on that 86.1 is actually reversed on that wet bulb thermometer that I was mentioning earlier yeah. so 86.1 on that thermometer is about equivalent to 100 degrees Fahrenheit normally. So that's with okay. into account the heat index, the humidity, the surface you're on. So okay. it, yes, it relatively does look low, but in reality, it's a little bit, it's much hotter okay. than you would think. Yeah, so, so wet, it- So that's, it'll, that's a wet bulb reading at 86. .1. Yes, that is with a wet bulb reading. Okay. That is not a normal Fahrenheit reading. Yes, that, that, is that might explain it. Cause I was looking at like Montgomery County, Maryland and, and maybe, there you know maybe mm -hmm. there was theirs was just an outdoor temperature so actually that would be more in line then okay that's helpful yeah yes, everyone um a lot of schools oh go ahead i'm sorry oh no uh, i was just gonna say you you had said that um coaches get training how about the athletes themselves mm -hmm. what, is there any type of of training around um you know what they should how they should prepare themselves, uh, what they should look for in in uh, temperature or, you know, issues that come up throughout the season. Mm -hmm. So there's technically no, I would say, formalized training. However, I definitely send out a lot of things to athletes 
athletes and their team specifically. So I work very closely with a lot of the team captains. I send a lot of prior to tryouts, um, like this is how much you should be hydrating. This is what you should, I recommend that you eat this type of like complex carb so that you're nice and fueled. You should have water with you and things like that. Um, I definitely, there's no formalized training for them to click on, but I do take it upon myself to work with those captains just so that everyone's nice and prepared when we go into the season because heat stroke, it, the thing about it is it can happen really fast and heat injuries are very scary when they happen. So the best I can do to prevent them, that is the number one thing of why I'm there is injury prevention. So I take it upon myself to make sure that athletes are fully prepared before we step on that field. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Is, is there any kind of acclimatization schedule for kids when they're coming on at the, like, say, you know, for tryouts, um, you know, in that August period, mm -hmm. or is it mostly that you're just kind of trying to schedule them during cooler parts of the day? It's a little bit of both. So we do, so for football, for example, just because they have to get used to playing in pads in the heat, there is a five day acclimatization period for them. That's per MIA regulation. So they start that Friday before everybody else in August um, and there are no pads the first day. They're only out there for an hour and then we slowly increase them. So it's every, the first three days are pa no pads for an hour. Then it's uppers for an hour and a half uppers again for an hour and a half. And then on the fourth day, they can finally go full pads, but they can only be outside for an hour. And then that fifth day they get up to full pads an hour and a half. Um, Everyone else, just because they don't have as heavy as equipment, they don't necessarily have to acclimate. However, I do recommend to the coaches that you're not trying, if we can work in that 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. since they don't have school those first couple of weeks, a little bit easier than trying to schedule tryouts from noon to three o'clock when the sun's at its strongest. So we do our best to work around it, but um, just based on availability of space, that doesn't always happen. So those teams in the middle of the day, if they are, we try and prevent it from being football and someone who doesn't necessarily have as heavy as equipment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, just because I know we have another speaker tonight, um, maybe we'll do a last call for mm -hmm. questions for Sam. Anyone? Well, uh, seeing none, Sam, I want to say thank you. It's very helpful to get this perspective, um, and your experience uh, can be a guide for us as we think through these issues. I'll simply add that having read a fair number of studies now, many of them peer-reviewed about injuries of turf versus uh, natural grass, I think your experience isn't it's pretty close to what I've seen in the studies. Um, you know, there's some variation sometimes mm -hmm. depending upon particular type of injury, but in general, sometimes turf is better. Sometimes uh, grass is better. You know, it, it actually gets closer to an equivalency than, than one would think before you read these studies. So your real world experience, I think, is pretty close to what I've seen in the studies, too. So it's very helpful to hear that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, if you have, have any more questions, please let me know. Thanks, Sam. I appreciate that. Thank you, Sam. Thank, Thank you, you for Sam. your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So moving on, uh, we have our second speaker of the night, and we're doing pretty well time-wise, I think, at this point. Um, and uh, I think Mike was originally going to introduce her, but Joe, I don't know if you want yeah, to Yeah, I, I said I you were clear. Come here. Yep, I was uh, I'm on deck for that. Okay, um, I'll, I'll hand it off great. to you then. <laughs> great. So um, we're joined by um, Dr. Helen Poynton uh, from UMass Boston. Uh, she's a full professor in the School of Environment at UMass Boston, um, and um, her research. Um, oops, I lost my page where I had my intro information for her. Uh, sorry. So. Um, she, like I said, she's a professor at UMass Boston. She served on the uh, Massachusetts Massachusetts Toxic Use Reduction Act Scientific Advisory Board, um, and her research focuses on the toxic effects of metals and emerging pollutants on aquatic life. So I think um, she's uh, here to talk to us, sort of moving beyond the sort of direct impacts on on the, the immediate direct impacts on people, but sort of the larger impacts 
uh, on the environment um, and of of uh, the you know artificial surf and some of the chemicals that are found uh, within them. Um, and um, she is uh, has a, a bachelor's of science in biochemistry from Temple University and a PhD from um, University of California at Berkeley uh, in uh, molecular and biochemical nutrition. Uh, she also did a postdoc at US EPA. So I think she brings a tremendous amount of knowledge and we're glad that Mike was able to get in touch with her um, and have her present uh, or talk with us tonight. I think um, she has some slides to share, right? Um, and uh, that may help answer yeah. some of the questions that were uh, posed in advance. But I, again, as with, with the previous speaker, I think the idea is to make this kind of an interactive uh, discussion. So um, Dr. Poynton, thank you very much for joining us and I'll turn it over to you. Dr. Poynton, I just, uh, I just made you a co-host so you can go ahead and share your screen if you'd like. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Thanks everyone for um, the invitation to talk. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm a professor of ecotoxicology. I've studied lots of different types of pollutants. Um, I, I can't say I've ever done any studies specifically on artificial turf. Um, so a lot of what I'm drawing on are is peer reviewed literature and some of it I'm sure that you've seen. It sounds like you're already a pretty um, well educated group on, on this topic. So, um, you know, but hopefully I can help to answer questions that you have about some of these studies um, to better understand what, what they mean. Um, so I'll just, um, I'll share this. So you see the presentation? Okay, okay, great. Um, so I'll just move on to, so I'm going to just quickly kind of give an overview of um, some of the principles of my research program at UMass Boston. Um, very quickly, what is artificial turf? Because most of us know what this is. And then I'll go over some of the questions that Mike sent me ahead of time that the committee had. Um, so one, since I was in graduate school, um, I really took this, um, this effects-based approach to looking at uh, environmental effects of contaminants. And the idea is that you can't just measure the, the chemicals that are out in the environment. You really need to do some type of um, bioassays that look at how those chemicals are reacting with organisms that live in the natural environment to understand the toxicity. Um, and I've come up against lots of, um, lots of interesting groups in, in risk assessment. Um, it's kind of the primary focus is on just going out and measuring contaminants. And it doesn't, it gives you a really limited picture of what is going on in my experience. Um, I try to do research that matters to ecosystems and to people. And whenever possible, try to engage communities in a participatory manner and acknowledge the fact that they bring unique expertise uh, to the table. And if you don't take advantage of that, then you're you're really going to lose out in your your research. Um, so artificial turf has these three main components um, where we could potentially get some risk um, from them. So first is the artificial turf fragments, the blades of grass. Um, and these are usually made out of polyethylene plastic or nylon. Um, and we also know that PFAS has been detected in these um, these blades of grass. Um, there's the infill that kind of, I guess, sort of acts as soil in this artificial turf system. Um, and it's been um, kind of a uh, one component that was being used for a long time. It was thought of kind of like a win-win scenario of we can recycle these tires and we can use them for a purpose um, is this tire chrome. Um, and there's a lot of issues with that that I think that you've already kind of come across. Um, you can also fill it with other types of rubber, um, uh, new synthetically made uh, rubber particles are sometimes used, um, acrylic coated sand. Um, and most recently I've seen um, plant-based materials being proposed um, 
And then there is the, the backing at the very bottom that everything is attached to. And that's either a polyester or a polyurethane um, type of plastic that's used for that. Um, so one thing that we have to consider is that these um, artificial turf fields are existing out in the weather. Um, and different weather conditions, exposure to lots of sun, as well as exposure to storms, um, causes fragments to uh, come off. So these MATF, which are fragments from the, the turf fragments or the grass, and then MRPs, which are rubber-based particles. Um, and these are more, these are usually put into like the microplastics type of range, which is under, um, under five millimeters in size, um, but can be much, much smaller than that. Um, and so one of the questions was, what are the most important chemicals for potential impacts to the environment? Um, looking at the studies on artificial turf fields, it seems like these two legacy contaminants um, that have been studied for decades, metals and polyaromatic hydrocarbons, are the most commonly detected chemicals in the leachate from the, these turf fields. Um, the two primary metals of concern are lead and zinc. Um, zinc is not as much of a problem for human health, but it's um, very toxic to uh, aquatic life, um, especially crustaceans, which are kind of at the base of the, the food chain. Um, and then polyaromatic hydrocarbons are usually associated with like burning fossil fuels, but apparently there's really high concentrations of them in both the blades of grass, as well as some of the different types of infill. Um, and then PFAS, um, which are, you know, been given the name forever chemicals. They have one of the strongest bonds in the universe, this carbon fluorine bond. Uh, that's very, very hard to break. Uh, there's over 5,000 different versions of this chemical. Um, only a fraction of them have been studied. Um, about six of them are monitored in Massachusetts drinking water. Um, and they have a lot of really detrimental effects to humans as well as wildlife. So if you see developmental toxicity and endocrine disruption, immunotoxicity in humans, you can be sure that those same kinds of effects are being experienced by other vertebrates in the ecosystem, um, such as uh, fish, if we're talking about the aquatic ecosystem. Um, I, when I talk about these chemicals to my students, I call them the lead of our generation. Lead was banned the year I was born um, in gasoline. And, um, you know, now we have this, these PFOS chemicals. Um, plasticizers, these um, include phthalates and bisphenol A. Uh, in the early 2000s, um, bisphenol A, there was, it was all over the news because of it being found in, in water bottles and baby bottles. Um, so these are the kinds of chemicals that we're talking about. Um, these are also endocrine disrupting chemicals. The phthalates primarily come from the plastics. So they're used when making the plastic in the blades of grass. Um, and um, they can leach out as the, the grass kind of degrades over time. Um, and you, you don't always know what type of phthalate chemical or whether bisphenol A was used. Um, it's often like proprietary information. Um, this chemical, 6-PPD quinone, uh, was discovered in um, 2021. Um, uh, this science paper made headlines because it was detected to be the primary uh, chemical responsible for fish kills in Washington state. And this was from tire particles. So tire particles were leaching into the streams. And when um, uh, they did this, a chemical called 6-PPD, which is intentionally placed into the fires, into the tires, um, would react with ozone and cause this quinone to form. Um, and that's extremely toxic to, to fish. Uh, and then finally, uh, microplastics, uh, which are, you know, they, they don't break down in the environment. The environmental impacts of them are still kind of under investigation. Um, uh, and, 
you know, some studies, they show that they can inhibit ingestion and stuff in organisms, uh, really depending on the, the concentration. Um, and other studies show that they can be can, the carriers for other type of contaminants. So these are kind of like my top six, if I had to give <laughs> what are the chemicals of concern. And it's not, you know, some of them are um, specific to the tire chrome um, infill, and some of them are related to the plastics that are that are used. So I'll stop here if there are more questions about these types of chemicals. Uh, Dr. Poynton, I, I, I'll just jump in first. Aren't, have microplastics been banned? I so, thought they were. I thought there was some federal regulatory issue because they were appearing in like there were soaps and shampoos mm -hmm. and stuff. And I thought, thought like five or six years ago, the federal government through regulatory action banned the, their use in manufacturing. Products. So they're, they're banned for specific uses in those like hand soaps and facial mm -hmm. soaps. Mm -hmm. um, but that's pretty much the only within the United States, um, the European mm -hmm. Union recently banned all intentionally added microplastics okay. um, and actually included artificial turf infill in that category. But that's Europe, not the United States. That's right? Europe. That's right. Anyone else want to jump in? Yeah. Joe? Uh, Helen, uh, can you just tell us um, which one of these would be related to the chrome rubber? Uh, so the, the, Wait, the, oh, so the tire, chrome, yeah. right? Yeah. So the 6-PPD quinone um, is related to the tires, um, but you'll also find that in any type of infill that is made from rubber, because the 6-PPD, that parent compound, is placed in most types of rubber to um, help with its durability and actually um, to help keep it from breaking down in the presence of ozone. So the fact that it creates this quinone is is somewhat intentional to protect the rubber, but then it's released into the environment and uh, extremely toxic to fish. Is, is that the only one that was primarily the tire related? Um, so um, the um, So some of these other chemicals are found at higher levels in the tire chrome than they are in the blades of grass. But I would say that's probably the only one that would be specific for the infill. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it would not be correct to say that the metals are less likely to be in the, the alternative infills? Um, it that depends on which ones you're you're talking. I mean, there's a lot of seems to be a lot of alternatives out there, and um, really most of the research has been focused on this the tire chrome and the other rubber types. Um, oh, Leslie, I think you're on mute. I'm, yeah, sorry, I was muted. I can't. Yeah, I can't let you hear my mental rumblings. Um, <laughs> So has have are you aware of any research that has been done to look at these more recent organic infills, things like um, you know, coconut hulls or things that are more of, of a more natural nature to that have been looked at to replace that from rubber that is just, you know, filled with problems as we can see. Do you know of any? Uh, research or any issues that have surfaced on these natural infills? Um, I spent a good bit of time trying to find research on that. And the um, uh, really the only place where I found anything is from the Tory guide on artificial turf, which I'm assuming that you've seen. Um, and they kind of go through a couple different types of of infills and they include those natural ones. Um, but I mean, even there, they're they're not really saying much. They, there's some issues with occupational exposure for some of these things, mostly dust inhalation. Um, um, 
I mean, my thought is that they probably need to have some type of preservative added to them so that they don't break down really quickly. Um, but I don't know, you know, what that would be. And, and therefore I can't really speak to any of the, the toxic components that could be in it. Thank you. I think that's some of what we've been finding. Yeah. So. Just not a lot known. Um, can you talk about um, just sort of the the um, the different exposure routes? Because most most of the stuff that that I've been sort of looking at and reading at it it talks about the the water, you know, being the you know ingestion being the the biggest um, concern, especially with the the PFAS, and and that's how folks are being uh, exposed. But additionally, like I, I know that there's PFAS in lots of other materials, so I'm just kind of wondering, you know. Do you know, or could you talk a little bit about like what, I guess, maybe different exposure routes might, I mean, I don't think that there's been any levels that have been determined, but I don't know if there's a way to talk about like the comparison of the drinking water versus um, just in the sort of passive play or, you know, in products and whatnot. I don't know if I'm asking the right sort of question. Um. So it, but it sounds like you're, you're trying to get at human health impacts. Um, and, um, uh, I'm not really prepared to talk about, um, to talk about that. And, you know, no I think in a lot of communities, it's still kind of, we're trying to figure out why it's in our drinking water. Um, you know, I live in Sharon and we had to shut down one of our, our pumps because of really high levels of PFAS. And that was only after you know, the state imposed regulations on the level. So how long were we drinking that water before, um, before they were imposed and, but trying to trace where PFAS, how PFAS got into drinking water is, you know, that's a really hard question. Um, and it probably came from multiple, multiple sources. Um, but we don't want to be adding more <laughs> to the environment and that's already there. Yeah. So, so can I ask a question, Helen? So, it sounds like if if there was no drinking water potential exposure, then there's potentially for again for humans, you're not prepared to 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 speak to it. But if there's no like drinking water exposure, and we have no fish in a nearby say there's no stream nearby or there's no you know brook where are the where's the hazard there like where would your concerns lie um all right well this is this is like complete speculation at this point <laughs> but if you were um you know you had athletes on a field i would assume they could it could get on their hands as if they like fall on the the artificial grass um it could you know wiping sweat off of their face they could they could get it could get on their their face and you know possibly end up you know getting into some type of opening in their body whether it's their eyes or their their nose or mouth that way but okay, no, thank you. okay. i understand that um Dr. Point, and I don't know if you want to keep going. Okay, sure. Um, so this is this was a study that I found to be really interesting because a lot of the the manufacturers of these um, these turf products will conduct aging studies in the lab, and so they they did a comparison between aging studies that were done in the lab and with um, actual field conditions for these artificial turf. And so on this side, we have from the blades. Um, these are chemicals measured in the blades. Um, and then this is from that rubber infill. And this is the chrome rubber. Um, and they measured higher levels of heavy metals as well as those peri polyaromatic hydrocarbons um, in the, the actual field conditions versus the, um, the, the aging studies in the lab. 
Um, and I was really surprised at the high levels of the polyaromatic hydrocarbons in the the plastic blades. Um, I would have, you know, that's something I would expect to find in the crumb rubber infill, but to see that it's also leaching from the blades, I thought was was concerning. Um, and then we we already kind of knew that there were issues with metals uh, coming from um, both of these different sources. Um, okay, so there was a question about the the effect of heat, and I heard us talking about heat already. Um, and the, um, you know, if there was runoff from hot, you know, 10 degrees hotter artificial turf fields, um, I, that could increase the temperature of the water in the surrounding wetlands. Um, the impacts of concern would be increasing the, the heat above the tolerance of the species that are living there, um, as well as decreased dissolved oxygen because warmer water is associated with um, lower oxygen in the water. Um, but these impacts would be really site specific. It would depend on how much runoff, where it's going, um, the how the the drainage works with the artificial turf that's that's put in. Um, and and then you know the characteristics of the area that it's it's flowing into. Um, so I was trying to find some information, like maybe trying to compare the runoff from like a blacktop parking lot versus an artificial turf field. And there's really no one that's done that kind of study. Um, I would suspect that the impact would be less than a parking lot because um, there is a drainage system that will supposedly allow some of the water to trickle through and end up um, in the soil instead of just you know running off like a, a blacktop would. Um, but that was really, it was very hard to, to to find anything on this particular question. So I'm sorry about that. Um, are there any questions about, about this topic? Okay. Um, and then the, you know, we've already been talking about this, the infill, um, whether it's a concern for the environment. So here's this, the European Union statement that um, banned products with intentional microplastics, and they included artificial turf infill in um, uh, in that ban. Um, the the leachate from the chrome rubber infill. Um, there was a a recent study uh, that showed that it causes severe de developmental toxicity in vertebrates. Um, and it's really generally agreed to be the most harmful component um, when you're talking about the environmental concerns of artificial turf um, and related to these different chemicals, the microplastics, the metals, the 6-PPD quinone, and the PAHs. Um, and so this is the that table from the, um, the Toxic Use Reduction Institute. Um, I'm sure that you've seen this report. Uh, anyone who starts to dig into effects of, of artificial turf um, runs across this. Um, and I'll just say that I, you know, I am on this toxic use reduction um, uh, scientific advisory board. And so we do interact with the scientists that put together this uh, report. Um, and, you know, I have a lot of respect for them. They, they do really, really good work. Um, and so they, you know, they have these different categories, they have the tire chrome, they have these other types of rubbers here. And I would say that you could group all of these different types together. And these are the types of infills that you definitely want to avoid. They're gonna have similar impacts um, in the environment. Um, it leaves the acrylic coated sand and these mineral or, or plant-based um, options, which, uh, you know, you can see expected to be absent, expected to be absent. There's really not very much um, research that's been done. Uh, this report was from 2019, and I haven't been able to find anything that's new on um, on this with, you know, 
I, admittedly the limited amount of time that I had to to do uh, research on this. So Helen, just do you know like when it means because I think you know this is 2019 and the industry has certainly developed more organic infill materials like the shredded wood, which is kind of there now, and the coconut is that that's not like what is mineral or plant based? What is that? Is that do you know um, what that is? So I think that that was in that category. Okay. Um, um, I was just curious. I mean, you know, I, but I you can see that in in this table, there's it's there's so much that's grouped together. It's it's very hard to say anything, um, uh, in particular about one particular product. Um, I would just want to know if you you do go like you're looking at some of these wood based products to find out if they're using um, any types of chemicals to preserve the wood. Um, you know, like arsenic based compounds were really popular in playgrounds, like up until not too long ago. So, um, you know, I would be, you know, like what, what keeps it from just turning into the mulch that I put on my garden, you know, that just, <laughs> that disintegrates within the season that they must be doing something, but I don't know what it is. Thank you. Um, and then I think the last question from the committee was about um, the climate change impacts of this. And so I was able to find, there was a study that was done that did a life cycle assessment on um, a specific artificial turf field, but it was supposed to be kind of representative um, in Toronto, Canada. And it was estimated to be 55.6 tons of CO2 equivalents. Um, if you're like me and you don't really know what that means, <laughs> um, it is equivalent to the emissions from uh, 26 cars over a year. Um, so I drew these 26 little cars here to kind of show the the impact. Um, I think that another thing that that should really be considered um, is that the plastics industry sustains the fossil fuel sector. And it's becoming a more and more important lifeline for the fossil fuel industry as we're decreasing, um, you know, we're trying to move away from fossil fuel based fuels. Um, so right now it's about 8% of the fossil fuel industry use goes into plastics. Um, and that that has been increasing steadily uh, over the years. Um, and so by, you know, supporting the use of plastics, you're supporting the use of fossil fuels, and it will be very difficult to completely phase out fossil fuels until we find a way to reduce our dependence on plastics. Um, and that's, that is all that I have. So I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see everyone. Do we have any um, overall questions for Dr. Poynton? Uh, I think it was very informative and sometimes it's helpful not only to get your perspective, but your perspective about other scientific studies perspectives. Um, I have one co uh, clarifying question about the study you just read um, or, or discussed. So when they looked at that Toronto field, they were looking at the carbon impact of an artificial turf field, but did they compare that to the carbon impact which I'm assuming would be much less, but the carbon impact of maintaining a natural turf field. Um, they did do that comparison. I mean, it was, uh, it was much, much less the the natural sure. field. I didn't. <laughs> it wasn't part of the question, so I didn't yeah. stick it on the yeah. the yeah. slide. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, there's carbon impacts on everything, right? I mean, there's a carbon impact on this for this Zoom call we're doing. Right. And yeah. As minimal yeah. as it is, I'm sure there's still a carbon impact. So I mean, it's just yeah. But yeah, okay, thank you. Other questions for Dr. Poynton? I have others, but I, I want to defer to, to the group. Uh, this, is, this is your opportunity. <laughs> I guess I'll ask um, yeah. the, ha, do you have any research or have you seen any research on the type of contaminants 
I mean, this was based on looking at artificial turf, but dirt can have contaminants as well. What is a, I mean, have we looked at what baseline contamination exists in, you know, some of our grass environments? And, and um, turf well, field? Sure, like, I mean, lead is, is right. one of those ubiquitous contaminants. Right. Um, and that was because of the use of, of leaded gasoline. Um, so some and... of these contaminants do exist in the, I'm not going to say naturally in the environment because they're probably, they're unnatural to the environment, but they exist in the environment. And so I'm trying to, you know, wrestle with some of the existing contaminants that we have out there. And, you know, we hear about uh, contaminants coming through weather, um, contaminated rains um, and snow that can um, leach into fields and streams and how much of that exists out there. Um, so in, in a place like Arlington, I would yeah. think that the lead levels in your soil are pretty low. Um, the areas where we find really high levels are, of, of lead are, are mostly in inner city areas um, or directly around highways. Um, How about former landfills? Particularly former landfills. the landfills in Arlington tend to be, have been farm waste landfills. Is that, is that typically a source of environmental contaminants? Um, farm waste what so like I know the park across the street from my house was a <laughs> partly a farm and then whatever waste they had from like I don't know farm equipment <laughs> that's that's what that dump was it was a former landfill um and it's capped but it was you know I don't think it was a, a just a regular old garbage dump but it was it was concentrated around farm waste and I think my understanding is that's true in Arlington, although someone here may know better. Is there particular contaminants that are found there? Well, some um, of and actually the really chat is saying it was a municipal landfill. Yes. I mean, several of our, what are now playing fields were built over former municipal landfills where trash was dumped. That's true about Poets. It's true about Buzzle. It's true about McLennan. But I don't know, I don't know that existing, I don't know that testing results exist in, in those areas. And I, I guess I was trying to figure out if there's, you know, a general consensus of the types of contaminants that you might see from that type of former use of areas that are now natural grass um right so if they're if they're capped um then on the surface that's probably not a huge issue um they could be leaching contaminants depend into the groundwater um i would think that that's where you would uh you know typically they'll they'll drill a well um they'll set up a well and and try to measure um the levels that are ending up in the groundwater from those sources. And I, I know that landfills have definitely come up in, in the conversations around where PFAS is getting into drinking water, um, you know, particularly areas that use groundwater as their source of drinking water. And Helen, you mentioned about something about like near, being near a highway. So if we had a field that was adjacent to a major highway, which we, we do, that is was also a landfill and it's probably you know i don't know what is it everyone probably like a 200 yards or so from the highway if that um is that as a potential to get like what's what's what could happen there is that just the tire dust that could get on is that would be the grass exposure that would worry about um so i was talking about highways mostly in relation to lead 
Um, oh, okay. And it, it would have been tieways that were present, you know, 30 years ago when before the, the band went into effect. Okay. Um, Dr. Point, and I have a question just about PFAS. I mean, a few years ago, I, when PFAS kind of started to emerge into the public consciousness more than just the scientific community, I, I was reading a lot about it on a regular basis. And I have to admit, I haven't read as much about it in recent years. So I'm sure there's been a lot more study and a lot more results. But one of the things that struck me a few years back about PFAS, and I'm going to speak just to you know human effects, not aquatic or wildlife which is a separate matter but you know obviously um you know the great concern was about drinking water but there was sort of a there seemed to be a consensus that um you know PFAS is definitely getting into humans and that you know testing on humans showed that sometimes it, there was a lot of PFAS in our bodies at any given time and how it got there wasn't always clear. Some of it could have been from drinking water. Some of it could have been from other way, means of getting in there. There also seemed to sort of be a consensus that over time, PFAS leaves your body, though how fast and how in what form it was never, that I guess wasn't as developed a few years back. But the real thing that seemed always a little speculative to me, concerning but speculative, was the effect of PFAS on humans, the health effects. I mean, it there was always sort of a loose connection to endocrine issues, fertility, you know, issues, but like there wasn't, at least a few years back to my mind, I never saw like a direct one-to-one -one link like you have with like smoking, like you smoke, you're going to get lung cancer. It was always a little more at the time, sort of indication indicators, but nothing direct saying, you know, PFAS will lead to this, this, and this. I don't know if that's changed and I don't know if you may think I'm, and I'm perfectly open to this, uh, but maybe I've misinterpreted what I read even a number of years ago. But what is the sort of consensus these days in the scientific community about PFAS and its effect on humans, sort of how it gets into our bodies, how it gets out of our bodies, and then its effect on us while it's in our bodies? Um, so I would say that the scientific consensus has moved more towards that they're very bad chemicals for humans. Um, um, you know, this is, it's falling in the human health area where I didn't really prep for, for tonight. So I'm That's really fine. basing That's this fine. off yeah. of, yeah, you yeah, know, no. um, lectures that I give in my classes from a long time ago. Um, and the, so they, they cause a, a, large number of different types of effects, developmental, um, the endocrine effects that you you described, so causing, um, you know, reproductive impacts. Um, uh, one thing that came out during COVID was that they suppress the immune system. They make it more difficult for vaccines to work, um, even at low levels. Um, and, um, you know, there have been some environmental justice communities that have been um, impacted by really high levels of PFAS, and they definitely have um, uh, increased incidences of um, really kind of terrible outcomes, um, uh, um, you know, reproductive related outcomes as well as cancers. Um, so especially the ones that have been the most studied, so the PFOA and PO, PFOS, those are, um, you know, they're banned for, for a good reason. And they're being regulated by the EPA and um, other organizations for, for really good reasons. That's helpful. Thank you. I know, I know you had to go a little off script for that, but I appreciate <laughs> it because it's still, still very, I mean, getting access to a scientist is helpful for us, you know, you know, you're, you're going to know more about this e even unprepared than we would prepare. So <laughs> I appreciate it. I, I have Any, a biology question. Yeah. Do they accumulate like um, up through the food chain? Is that part of the problem? Um, so if, you know, if we're fishing, are the fish going to have much higher levels than the 
invertebrates or whatever initially gets gets the compound um i'm trying to to think if i've seen um what literature i've seen on that and i don't want to i don't want to say anything that's not true I just had a, a question related to, um, I know that, you know, the scientific community has done a lot of studying and coming up with, um, you know, the impacts and effects of, you know, these different chemicals and what they do. Have, are you aware of any uh, type of partnerships where the scientific community partners with industry to mitigate and figure out ways to alleviate these effects and and I guess it just seems that they're both working on similar problems but almost in parallel tracks and the research doesn't suggest to me that there's any collaboration are you seeing anything different that, you know, maybe you could make us aware of? Um, I mean, I can't say specifically for these particular compounds, but yeah. collaborations between, um, between scientists and industry on, on ecotoxicology studies is common. Um, and there's often, there's a lot of, um, uh, uh, a lot of this work is also done by consulting companies. And so like you'll see on a paper, like you might see a, on a paper, some, some scientists that are from a consulting company, some scientists that are from an industry and some study, scientists that are from academia. And that's, that's not uncommon. Okay. Cause we've gotten some pushback, you know, it's like there's a, a perception that industry is bad and that their experience isn't is is just monetarily driven but they are but there is there is there are some good things happening between the scientific and the business community is what your answer would suggest to me um i don't know <laughs> no okay so um and you know, especially in the, within the field of toxicology, it's really hard to find, um, you know, players from industry that, that you can look at and we're like, oh yeah, they were doing the right thing. It's, um, um, you know, starting with lead, asbestos, yeah. PFAS, the industry tried to hide the effects. They knew these things were harmful and they they tried to bury the studies and hide the effects. Okay. And most of, you know, you're talking about like DuPont, 3M, Procter & Gamble, they all have toxicologists on their staff. And, um, you know, some of them are good people. Whether they always get to publish the results and um uh and you know convey what they found is is another question thank you the last round for dr Poynton, who's been very generous with her time anyone uh, I would say there are I like a million questions in the chat. <laughs> that well, I but I think we've been sort of keying into them a little bit, and then some of them have been more okay. Comments. Okay, I'll, I'll admit, so a lot of them are more comments uh, or observations than questions. But uh, if there's anything you see in the chat you want to weigh in on, uh, but I mean, I I note that I think more of them were in the form of comments than questions. Um, or if anyone okay. on the committee wants to latch on to one of them and, and voice them. Uh, but I, I just was curious, Dr. Point, are you okay um, sharing your slides with us? Um, sure. Like, I can you do know, that. sort of the, the file. So we can, I know there were some questions about looking at them. 
That'd be great. And then I can uh, have them posted to the artificial turf um, study committee website. That would be great. Yeah, I'll well, add also, a, a slide at the, the end video. with some of the references that, um, and if there's any links available. So, and I'll share it as a PDF if that's okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, well, if there's nothing else, we'll say thank you, Dr. Poynton. We really appreciate your time and your knowledge. Um, and um, if we have a follow-up question, would you be available over email for us to reach out and ask a question or two if we something comes up over the next few weeks? Um, sure, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> it's all any of us can do, really. <laughs> so uh, I think your best is better than, than most of ours. So, so thank you. Um, excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Poynton. We appreciate right. you can stay on or, or, or check out if you want. Thank you. Um, we, we Good still night, have everyone. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Um, so the rest of us have a couple of just, and I know it's 612, so, you know, I don't think the next few things will take more than 10 minutes, but if you'd all just kind of hang in there. Um, I want to say, you know, very informative speakers tonight, very happy about it. I have a speaker coming for the next meeting. So the next meeting, the plan, I guess we're into agenda item four now, Natasha reports yep. deliverables project timeline. Um, the plan, as you saw, <laughs> the original plan has already made way for a revised plan. It may not be our last rev revision, but for now, I think the dates through March 1st are pretty set in stone, which is the first deliverable um, was, a, well, actually I'm gonna revise, <laughs> revise it again. I think we said we would be due this Friday, but due to open meeting considerations um, and Natasha having to post things because of the long weekend and Monday not being a business day, she has to post everything on Thursday. So if everything could be in uh, Natasha's hands by what time Thursday morning? Yeah, um, Thursday morning would be great, but uh, yeah. no later than 12 would be really appreciative yeah. just so that I have to get everything posted by five and it's not really all on me that I can do that. So, and that would be the same for anyone that um, in the public that would like to submit any kind of comments or or whatnot, um, just to please get those to me by Thursday um, at noon at the latest. And if you could get it sooner, that would be really appreciative. So what will happen next is a very quick turnaround. Um, you know, within two weeks of that deadline, there will be another deadline for the narrative sections. So essentially, expanding the bullets into something that could be in theory dragged and dropped uh, into into a larger report um so to the extent if you haven't started that as soon as your bullet points are done i would recommend quickly turning to that because then well obviously the bullet points will be a guide but when you have to sort of flesh these things out it does take a lot longer um the plan is uh so you know First deliverable, the bullet points would be this Thursday morning due to Natasha, who will share them with the agenda uh, for next Tuesday's meeting. And then the plan next Tuesday is to spend the first hour of our meeting with another guest speaker who may, who may take less than that, but uh, may take more. I have found someone who is an expert uh, in both uh, turf natural grass and artificial turf sort of someone from the industry so to speak but has worked in with both has uh and i can tell you more about him and give you more of his bio um before the meeting but it's someone i think is going to be very 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 knowledgeable on this topic from sort of more of a um practitioner's perspective uh not not a scientific perspective but someone who works with the products uh with with natural turf and artificial turf all the time and and has vast experience in this area so um my goal would be to have him speak to us for up to the first hour and then our conversation would shift over to an initial discussion among us of um the group bullet points and so i would hope that people could be a little more generous with their time next tuesday i know it's some of you can't make it i realize it was a meeting we didn't initially want to have during school vacation week but we kind of have to have it based on the timeline so um i i sort of expect that meeting to be a two-hour meeting 
potentially, maybe longer, but maybe we just try to have a hard stop at seven or thereabouts. Um, the following week, uh, I'm losing track. I should have a calendar in front of me, Natasha. The, 20, the, the 27th. The meeting on the Tuesday, the 27th, we would continue our discussion about the bullet points because I think it's going to, this is really the first time each of the working groups has sh shown their hands, so to speak, has, has sh given us the deliverable. So it will be completely new to the members of the committee who aren't parts of those working groups. And there's probably going to be a lot to suss out and, and to discuss. So I didn't want to say, well, we get you know, one shot at one meeting. And if you miss the meeting, you missed the discussion. I really wanted it to be over two meetings. So that's what the principal focus of the following meeting would be. And of course, if we do get a, yet another guest guest speaker, we'll try to fit them in. But, you know, I think right now we're at a point where we just timing wise, we're, we're lucky to have the speakers we've had and we may not have time for, for more, especially as we keep pushing along on the, with the deliverables. Then the second, on um, I think it's Friday, March 1st, the second major deliverable is due the sort of narrative sections. After that, I, I have to say, it's not clear to me how much uh, the calendar we, the timeline we set out is, we're going to stick to it. Uh, you know, at that point, it gets a little dicey. It's sort of how far and how fast we can go uh, while still, I feel like, giving everything it's due. So uh, once we get to March 1st, we may have to reevaluate kind of the timing of things. But if you look at the timeline or the draft, revised draft timeline, you get a sense of how we have a lot to do in March. And so I guess my early ask to everyone is probably starting with our next meeting and going forward. Don't assume these are one hour, one hour, 10 meetings. Um, I don't want them to become all night affairs, but you know, we may need two or three hours at each of these meetings, or the alternative is to add even more meetings in order to get give everything it's due and to have a the kind of full discussion I think we need to have in order to reach a consensus by the deadline, which is very fast approaching. Um, the Jim, second I respect, thing I, Jim, I can yeah. respect that, except that I will point out to every other Tuesday will be an issue for yeah. standing park and recreation. So I certainly want to participate as fully, and I know Joe does as well, but our commission. When do those meetings begin, Leslie? Tuesdays Six or seven? Seven. seven. At seven. Okay. Well, maybe that encourages us every other Tuesday to get as much done by seven as we can. I mean, I mean, unfortunately, it means for you and Joe, you have very long, long nights. But uh, and our and our meetings are in person, so we I need to leave and travel. Yeah. Yeah. Um. What one question? I'm just throwing this out there. Would we be able to, are folks available to start the meeting at 4.30? Would that help anyone or no? Joe Barr, I'm seeing no. <laughs> it'd, be um, tough for, it'd be tough yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. just wanted to. But I just want to point that out. Yeah. As a Tuesday issue, not every well, Tuesday. Every Tuesday. other. Yeah. Well, and you'll see that it, after March 1st, tentatively we have dates, days other than Tuesdays being added, just, you know, and we'll quickly get a sense of, whether, you know, we're going to need more time or I guess it's possible we may need less time. Um, but I just just want to set expectations that, um, you know, the, the idea of the, you know, the uh, 60 to 70 minute meeting is may start to vanish, you know, and that we may we may be here more like 90 to 120 minutes for future meetings, or potentially more, although, if we're going more than 120 minutes, we probably just need to be adding more nights rather than going forever, you know, in five hour meetings. The other thing I think we can do to speed things along at the end game, which we can do now is and I'm going to recommend everyone do this. In fact, I'm not going to recommend I'm going to say everyone should do this is I'm sure each of the working groups has been collecting all the various sources they've looked to while they've been working on the bullet points and ultimately on their sections. I think you should be sending your list of sources, whether if you've cited it or not cited or just simply read it, because I think if you read it, you've used it. Um, we would like to have you start sending those to Natasha so she can start building an appendix of all of the sources we relied on throughout this process because 
one thing we don't want is 48 hours before this thing is due, we're scurrying around on something that we could have easily done. And you can keep supplementing it. You read a new source, you send it to her, we can supplement. But I'm sure right now every group has had a baseline group of several dozen <laughs> sources they've looked to. Um, send those to Natasha. We can start building that appendix and sort of doing starting on the, some of the administrative work now rather than scurrying around to do that in the end game. And if I can just ask, I get a lot of emails. Um, so I'm hoping that maybe you can just put like AT for artificial turf and then reference or resource so that I can, reference would be better. That way, if I have to scan through in a week, I can I can get those. I'm going to start putting them into a separate mailbox, but um, that would just be helpful. So AT for athletic uh, artificial turf. Um, and it's it doesn't have to be just related to artificial turf. That's just how I'm de delineating. Um, so AT references would be great as the subject line. It, it probably also would be helpful knowing that it, maybe each group could send an email as yeah. a group. So someone could speak for the group and collect the group rather than getting, you know, nine, eight to eight emails to Natasha. It'd be nice if she could That'd get be nice too. three emails. Um, whatever you can do. But, you know, whatever you can do, knowing it will be supplement. I mean, this is, you know, just trying to lay the groundwork for less craziness at the end of the process. Is the idea going to be to use numbered footnotes or just have the references at the end? Because I, I feel like if we're sending them sporadically, but we haven't put those footnotes in yet. That could get, and we've got three three different reports that could get very unwieldy. So that's a great question. So, um, you know, we should have a, a common format, whether it's, you know, footnotes or, um, End notes. I mean, I, but I think we're, I'd say here, I may regret this. Each group should do what they're comfortable with for this, for the next two phases. And then it's on Natasha and me to make it look like a report with a common format. But um, do whatever you're comfortable with in the drafting. I don't want anyone to get hung up on, you know, the mechanics when, when Natasha and I will take that duty and make it all kind of meld but for the appendix part you know we just need to know anything you looked at because we're going to build that and and it's going to be a reference you know there'll be there may be several appendices to this report but one of them should just be this is all the sources consulted first person you know it can be and it should be first person conversations you've had too i mean not not if it was just a casual on the street person you talk to but i mean i know joe you you had you had a number of conversations with someone at MIT. Uh, you know, I would, I think we, sh we should be putting that in an appendix. Um, so yes, please, please keep that in mind. And the sooner you start that, the better. Anything else, Natasha, on sort of administrative or timeline? Um, I don't think so. Other than, you know, I think we're just going to have to be flexible as we get closer to March to figure out what we may or may not need. And, um, uh, you know, we'll just, we'll just go from there if we have to move around meetings. And if that's the case, if we're going to end up with a couple of meetings in a week, then um, agendas will likely be posted um, both at the same time, just to make sure we're in compliance with open meeting law. And so it may just be a little bit challenging at that point if I'm getting, uh, you know, comments from public or there's information that you'd like to share. So I will do the best that I can uh, in getting those into the packets. Um, and I just upfront appreciate everyone um, for your patience and understanding and cooperation. Yeah, and I just say that, you know, unfortunately there was a price to be paid from giving us a little more flexibility in February. Yeah. Um, the price that's to be paid is that we'll have tighter timelines and less flexibility in March. So I would finish by just cautioning every member of the committee to keep the first three weeks of March very flexible in their scheduling to the extent they can. I know commit, there are commitments, work commitments, family commitments. I get all that, but we really have a sprint. We go from a marathon to a sprint, the first three. I mean, right now, tentatively, we have to get this in by March 22nd. I don't want to sacrifice quality for, for that deadline. I think it can be done that we can have a good report and something that's finished and on time. But um, I would just say the first three weeks of March, keep them as flexible as you can. Any new business? 
I just had a question for Leslie and Joe, because one of the reasons we asked the high school athletic trainer about safety, heat safety training was that may be one of our mitigations. And um, we were wondering if all of the clubs that use your fields, do they have a heat safety protocol that you know of, or is that maybe by the different organizations they belong to? Or does does recreation have one their their own? We we don't have them, but that's a great question. Let me reach out to the user groups and find out if their um, governing bodies have one. Yeah, they may be more informal, but we can certainly find out the formality. I mean, I think I think the soccer club might be. Um, yeah, it looks like they do. No, I just, think yeah. seeing in the chart. That's seeing the chart. I, I would. I would. Guys are quick. I, that's would be my expectation. Yeah. Um, soccer is pretty good about things like that, and it may be just a matter of bringing it forward to a broader audience and making sure it's published. I'll, I'll reach out and get copies of everything. Any yeah, other new business? Well, we're in for a wild ride the next few weeks, but I wouldn't uh, want to do it with anyone other than this group. So I think this group really knows how to bear down and, and do some great work and work together. So we've got a lot on our plate, but I think it's um, it's doable and we're going to do it. So um, with that, is there a motion? Motion to adjourn. I'll, make, I'll second it. Okay, and uh, all the roll, I guess, Natasha. All right. It out. So Mike is absent. Uh, Joe Barr. Yep. Yep. Uh, Leslie. Yes. Jill. Yes. Marvin. Yes. Natasha is a yes. Jim. Yes. Yes. Okay, we are officially adjourned.